Good afternoon and welcome to the Ramson Holdings PLC Interim Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives in the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you over to Peter Kenyon, CEO. Good afternoon to you, sir. Thank you. Um, and uh, welcome, everybody. This is our first Investor Meets Company presentation. Um, obviously, we don't know whether you know what you know about Ramsden. So if we can go to page three, we'll, we'll give you a, a background. So um, we've been listed since February 17. Uh, and we have four key segments and then the other things that we do. So foreign currency exchange, it's 99% of that is travel money. So if you're off to Benidorm or Dubai and you want to take your euros or your dirhams, we're able to supply that for you and we buy it back off customers as well. Um, generally high volume pre-pandemic, we did over half a billion and served over 830,000 foreign cust customers for foreign currency. So that's the foreign currency segment, topped up with a bit of international money transfer that we do through a third party. And we have an old currency card that we're in the process of um, modernizing. Pawnbroking. So pawnbroking is a small sum short term loan. Um, it's secured on for ourselves a jewelry item, so a chain or a watch. Uh, customer gives us the item, we give them the cash. Customer repairs, we give them their item back. Um, throughout COVID and currently, the repayment rates are better than they've ever been. Uh, currently, it's about 88% of the people pay us back. Of the 12% that don't pay us back, we sell their goods. Um, when we sell it, if there's a shortfall, there are no debt consequences for the customer. And if we sell it with a surplus over what is owed, the customer get those money back. Average loan is £286, and our interest rates vary. You know, if you want to borrow £100, it's roughly 10% a month. If you want to borrow £10,000, it's down at 2% per month. The purchase of precious metals is where a customer has some unwanted jewellery. They don't want to loan, they just wish to sell it. So we'll happily buy that for them, from them. Um, and if we melt the jewellery, it goes through purchase of precious metals, if you like the scrap proceeds. Jewelry retailing, and you can see in the picture there, that's our new Eldon Square Newcastle store. So that window um, has new jewelry, it has secondhand watches, and it has secondhand jewelry. And that's the mix of the services that we offer. And where we sell that, that appears through jewelry retailing. The other services that we do, Western Union is an international money transfer, which is a like, cash payment into ourselves and a cash payment somewhere else in the world out to the beneficiary. We will uh, cash checks for customers. We have three franchised units and we have a little bit of credit broking income go through there as well. Um, we do not and have not for over 10 years now offered unsecured personal loans or high cost short term credits. So um, we are just offering pawnbroking loans, and that is what our FCA authorization is for. So that's who we are, what we do. Uh, 153 stores are ours, and we have three franchised units. If we could go to slide four. Thanks. Um, you know, pandemic hit February 20. Um, in February 20, we were in a good position. We were on for record profits, which was annualized at around 7.7 .7 million. Um, and we were in a good good place. We had a pipeline of new stores. We had activities that were working. And obviously, everyone knows what's happened in the intervening period. Through the presentation, we have got if like three or four columns for you, which is either an annual results for the last 12 months, but it's got March 20, which is substantially pre-pandemic. It's got the half year to March 21, which includes a retail lockdown, we remember, and, and very little international travel. And then we have the last six months ended 31st of March 22. 
We've strengthened our balance sheet in the last six months. Net assets up to 37.6 million. We have cash or net cash of 9.3 million and cash of 10.7 million. As a result of coming out of COVID and we're seeing a transition in customer behavior, we've restarted our dividend in earnest uh, and, and um, approved an interim dividend of 2.7p per share. We think we're well, second, well positioned for the second half of the year, which we will demonstrate how and why as we go through the presentation. Um, the right hand side of the slide has really the, the summary of how we how we think we have growth opportunities. And again, I think I'll leave that for now and I'll come back to them in detail further into the slide. So if we could go to page six, Martin, I'll, I'll take on the, uh, the financial review. Thanks, Peter. Um, as Peter said, we, we presented for you the March 20 figures, which really we would see as being more normalized pre-pandemic trading. Um, last year's figures were significantly hit especially in the new year, January, February, March, that period, a lot of high streets uh, locked down. We were still open because we have essential services, but obviously footfall down and, and trading was lower than we would normally expect. So revenue for this period, 29.3 million. That's up 51% on prior year, but it's actually 15% ahead of pre-pandemic volumes. Uh, and when you look at that, that's the retail segment, which has performed very strongly and the rest of the segments transitioning back through um, various levels of, of where we've got back to in terms of normalized trading. There is slightly fewer stores in, in the current six months than there were pre-pandemic. An average would probably be a, six, a reduction of about 5%, about six stores. So the, the admin expenses have reduced. Our biggest cost as a business is our staff, and the staff cost, the underlying staff cost, will go forward with inflation. You know, we've, we've put a pay review at the bottom end, uh, probably about 12% um, on average. At the top, it's much lower, and therefore the average increase in, in wages in the business is probably more like 8%. Um, so we do have some cost inflation, but certainly the rest of the business, the costs are, are very well controlled. Profit before tax, 2.2 million. So you can see that's, that's pretty much got back to where we were pre-pandemic at 2.3 million profit. So whilst you know, the business is transitioning back through um, at, at various levels through the segments, the profitability now has, has come back really strongly as we come out of the pandemic restrictions. We'll go through the segments on the next slide in, in more detail, um, but certainly the profitability back to where it was, EPS of 5.6 pence, which as Peter says, allowed us to, to restart the dividend um, at 2.7 pence. So we go to slide seven, We'll give a lot more detail here about the different segments of the business. So foreign currency, as Peter said, the restrictions through, through the travel industry um, significantly impacting us from the start of the COVID period. If you look at our report for our financial year to September 21, we explained that volumes for travel for our currency business around 30% um, of pre-pandemic um, levels. If you roll forward to the end of March, we got to about 60% of, of daily volumes that we'd expect to see. Uh, and what we said as well in the RNS is actually if you go forward again to, to where we are now um, in sort of April, May, we're, we're seeing volumes of about 85%. So travel certainly starting to, to really get some momentum. Um, and people like TUI and other, and other airlines are all giving, you know, those sort of numbers in terms of bookings for the summer. So we think... You know, restrictions easing will give us that opportunity to get currency back to, to, to some level of higher volumes. Um, and obviously with that, we'd expect to see strong profitability in the second half of the year. Um, but when you look at currency in the market for currency, obviously with that res restriction in volume, what you've seen is a lot of people in the market widening the pricing. We've, um, we've always been a price disruptor in the currency space, so we've always tried to be the cheapest. Um, so we've widened our margin like everyone else very slightly um, and still being the cheapest on the high street. But because we start from such a, a keen position on pricing, we've been able to move out and, and make more of um, gross profit, if you like, is recovering faster than, than the volumes that we're seeing. Pawn broken. Um, when you look at the, the start of the pandemic, people had more cash. They weren't, you know, they weren't going out uh, and about as much and spending money on other things. And therefore, loans got repaired. Our lending was 
7.7 or loan book at the end at the beginning of the pandemic. We've seen lending improve through the six months. And when we get to the end of the period in March 22, the loan book is 7.5 million. So not quite back to where it was, but you know, it's substantially back. But obviously there's a drag in terms of when you lend the money and when you earn the interest. So the PL income, if you like, will recover a bit slower than the loan book. And you can see there the gross profit for Pornbrook in 3.7 million for the six months. It was 4.7 for the March 26 months. So it's still on its way back through, but certainly the level of lending now um, that we're seeing um, day to day, the loan book has, uh, has recovered back to, to normalized lending uh, patterns. Jewelry retail. Um, so this segment is the biggest segment we've invested in the last two years. Um, so whilst the pandemic really restricted business for foreign currency and lending, um, jewelry retail has performed very well. We've invested heavily in retail stock, £6 million of inventory um, gone in in the six months. Of that, about two and a half million of that is premium watches. Premium watches have been a real success. Um, they've grown revenue-wise about 176% in the period. There's a huge demand for Rolex and, and other premium watches. Um, we had about 30 stores stock in um, premium watches. We've increased that to circa 90 stores. So it's, it's, it's a rollout, if you like, of, of more stores. And we've got the online business performing very strongly as well for watches. So the online business has grown 48% in the six months, and that's contributing as well to that jewelry retail growth that is coming through. Purchase of precious metals. So this is gold buying. And what we saw during the pandemic is less people on the high street, less people needing to sort of sell the gold in normal circumstances because you know they're not necessarily thinking about um, spending money as they would normally do. So what we saw is, is volumes in September 21, around about 80% um, of pre-pandemic levels. So as we've gone through the period, that's gradually got better. And as we've ended the period, that's, that's now the volume of the gold that we buy in is now back to, to pre-pandemic levels. The gold price is still relatively high compared to where it was in 2020. Um, so therefore, revenue has recovered a bit faster. Um, but certainly, the, the run rate now is slightly better than it's been on average in the, in, the, in the first half of the year. As Peter said, the other services, check cashing, Western Union, very stable products. And actually, check cashing has probably been in decline for a number of years. Um, and therefore, the, the services there are a half a million, if you like, for the six months. Not expecting anything um, significant to change with those services going forward. So whilst revenue is, is ahead of where we were pre-pandemic, total gross profit is still slightly behind. And that's from that recovery, that progression, if you like, of the, the three other big segments working back through. Um, but where we end the period in a really good um, position with all, all four key segments really as we enter the second half of the year. If we move forward to the, to the cash flow statement on page eight. What we have is we've always had a very cash generative business. Um, you know, we open a store, we pay the CapEx. Um, and then after that, the, the profit of the, of the store comes through as cash. You know, there's, there's not an investment required other than improving sort of improving the loan book um, and, and more stock if we move the store, et cetera. So the, the business has always been strongly cash generated. And we've used that cash historically. I guess our strategy has been half of that cash that we generate out as dividend half to, to grow the estate and grow the working capital um, of the segments. So, but what we've done in this period is that we, we've sort of step changed the, the stock, uh, the retail inventory. So you can see a substantial increase inventory and that's really working for us in terms of the retail sales that are coming through. The new store rollout has been slowed down during COVID um, and we've opened two new stores and we've acquired a business in this six months as we've sort of restarted that growth strategy. We bought a business in Boscombe of that 900,000 that was paid for the business about 400,000 of that is actually for retail stock that that business held. So you can see that we've been very cash generative. We've had a lot of cash during the COVID um, pandemic, and we've reinvested some of that cash into stock as we come out of the pandemic. So because we're cash generative, because the profitability has come back, 2.7 pence um, dividend, 
And you know that long-term strategy of, of being able to grow the business with half, approximately half of that profit that we generate, near the half reinvested for growth. So we move on to slide nine, which is the balance sheet. We started the, the, the pandemic with a very strong balance sheet and we came out of the pandemic with a very strong balance sheet. We've got very, very strong asset classes. You look at the inventory in our balance sheet, whilst you know we, we've got premium watches and new jewelry in there we've also got pre-owned jewelry which we actually hold at less than its intrinsic value um, and even the the new jewelry is backed at least 80 percent if not more by its intrinsic value as well so we can very easily turn that stock back into gold if we wanted to reduce our stock the trading of the receivables is the pawnbrook in lending and again we have very prudent lending policies and the liquidity of that asset is very strong. The cash in the balance sheet includes the currency that we sell to customers through the stores. So of the 10.7 million, 5.9 million of that in March 22 is currency in the till. So what we what happens with currency is obviously it's very seasonal. And as a business, we probably hold 5 million on average in the winter months. And that 5 million grows to 9 to 10 million in the summer months as the footfall and travel industry gears up for, for the key period. And what we have is we have a 10 million RCF facility currently, and we use that facility to increase that currency in the till across that five to 10 million swing. So we lend the money, um, put it in the till effectively in the winter, pay that back. So at the period end, we'd, we had borrowed 1.5 million, which net of Net of amortized cost is actually 1.4 million. Um, and you'll see that grow through the summer and then come back through the winter. We're a very strong balance sheet, 37.6 million, um, and well, well positioned. The pandemic has not hurt the business in terms of creating any legacy debt or creating a requirement to sort of rebuild any damaged balance sheet. So we're in a very strong position to kick forward with our growth strategy. Okay, thanks, Martin. If we could move to page through slide page ten, so you have a look at sorry, a window in, in closer detail. Uh, page eleven uh, is a summary of the four growth strategies that we have. We underpin that with well-invested systems. That's the IT system. That's the processes. That's the the control that we have in the systems and controls through our internal, internal audit and compliance and risk departments. The marketing and the brand position, um, the sports sponsorship that we have done over the years, the high street locations that we have uh, and how we look on those high streets. Um, the people, their ethos is the culture that we have within the business, that desire to give great customer service. Um, that underpins the, you know, the development of those staff. That's an ongoing uh, job of how we try and improve that day in, day out. And then we have our, our position on uh, ESG, and I'll come back to that later in the deck. Uh, so if we go to page 12, um, our strategies haven't changed. So our strategies have been very much the same uh, since coming to market and, and before. So we want to drive growth from our core estate. What does that mean? It means we want to do everything a little bit better. So we, we look at our foreign currency. We think, how can we... How can we manage this a little bit better? So we, you know, we manage the, the rates in different towns to make sure that we're very competitive. We try and influence our repeat customer rates. And then that bulk of customers that we serve for foreign currency, we want to um, cross sell our other services to them. Purchase of precious metals, that's that cross, -sell, cross selling conversation. So if you have um, unwanted jewelry that you don't wear in a jewelry box, then we want to make you aware when you're buying your currency from us of that service when you may, maybe never thought of do, selling that uh, jewelry for cash. Jewelry retailing, lots of investment in stock level, lots of investment in replenishment levels, skill levels, how we look and feel. Um, and, and that is a, a journey that we've, we've got some self-help and some momentum taking us into, if you like, the headwinds that... Uh, people are seeing with the rising cost of living. We've got some momentum already that should see that there's have the ability to grow going forward. 
home broking, we want to maintain our prudent lending, but there's opportunities for us to lend a little bit smarter. We're getting uh, better at identifying watches, which watches if we are left with, we can sell very quickly, which watches we're highly unlikely to be left with. And it's the same for other jewelry products. <clears throat> what else is there within the existing core estate? There's the opportunity to relocate. So on the picture, you've got Carlisle. Um, if you know Carlisle, we were in a sort of backwater location. Um, we've now taken the old H. Samuels unit on the high street opposite Smith's and the post office who sell foreign currency. So the locations change, the mix of services will change and we have been building up our uh, jewelry retailing and our foreign currency in this higher profile location. Since the, the period ends, we have relocated Durham and Newcastle. And Newcastle, I said, is on the, the front of the presentation. We've got three stores identified to improve the jewelry offering. Uh, one of those is one of the stores that we acquired from the money shop. In, in layout, it still looks like a money shop. It needs to be converted and that's in plan to do. Um, and we have a very flexible lease portfolio. Um, what I'm what happens there is, and I'll cover up on the questions that I've seen, is that if our um, lease has come to an end, and let's say the rent is a, one of the smaller rents at eleven or twelve thousand pounds, if we could get a ten percent reduction in the rent, uh, because there are still some independents still wanting to take that size of store, um, we'd lose that in um, legal fees in doing a new lease. So what we do is we leave the the, the property goes out of lease with the landlords relatively happy because they're getting a higher sum than than they would get if they renegotiated. But we have full flexibility should that location not suit our eye going forward because it's got isolated or the town centre has shifted. So opportunities to get better and drive growth from our core estate. And obviously the, the, the relocations that we've done that improve performance you know, as we see in 2023, we'll have a full year of the benefits of the relocations that we've processed through this year. Uh, moving on to slide 13, um, we think we've got quite a robust business model. We can replicate it in other towns. Um, there are uh, statistically 300 towns with 30,000 people or more residing in those towns of which London counts as one. So there's ample opportunity for us to grow our estate. Uh, we have some very successful stores in locations that have only got 12, 15,000 people. So we think that there's lots of options for us to, to grow the estate. Um, the recent change that we have made is that we have decided to come to the south and the southeast. Uh, and we planted a flag in Chatham and we will, we will roll out of, of Kent. By making that strategic decision to expand the geographic area of our store, which stores, which is now really national, uh, we were approached, were we interested in buying a business in Boston near Bournemouth? If we hadn't made that strate strategic decision, like previously two, three years ago, we would have said, no, we're not interested, that doesn't catch our eye. Now we've made this uh, decision to have a national approach it caught our eye, it was a very good business and we were very pleased to buy it. And that's one of the three additional stores that we have uh, opened uh, in the last, or in that period. And we would expect to have another five in the second half of the year. Uh, we've got a good pipeline to continue store opening at a rate of between eight and 12 annually uh, on a look forward basis. I'm aware some of you might not know our model. It has been in previous um presentations but if we have a new store it costs around two hundred fifty thousand pounds and that's roughly 50 percent the capex or the shop fit etc and 50 percent into the working capital so working capital to cover some early losses to cover the growth of the loan book to put the currency and the sterling in the tills and obviously the jewelry stock in terms of the performance of a new store the model um, is roughly a 20 to 30,000 pound loss in year one. And that's primarily um, the costs incurred before we open a store. So obviously we've got the rental costs before we open, we've got the staff recruited before we open. 
um, it gen passes into a 15, 20,000 pound profit in year two, and then a 60,000 pound profit in year three. The cohort that we opened about four years ago, running into uh, COVID, the worst store was performing to that model. The rest of the stores were performing better than that. And obviously that's what we wish to do. But that is an average model to give you an indication of, of what a new store would look like. In the bottom corner, that's our new store in the Argyle Arcade in Glasgow. Uh, that's the jewelry quarter of Glasgow and Scotland. If we go to slide 14. Um, jewelry retailing and the jewelry retailing website have had great progress, growth of 48%. Uh, period on period, you can see the, the growth chart there in the top right hand corner and a very nice picture of a Rolex watch. Um, it's now 15% of our total jewellery revenue, up from 9% pre-pandemic. Um, we want to push um, our website sales because it gives us that national approach now, uh, the ability to, to sell across the UK. Um, when we're maintaining our momentum with the investments in SEO, uh, uh, affiliate links, our pay-per-click activities, um, we're continually increasing the stock that is available online, which also acts as a catalogue for our um, store estate. And very recently, about three weeks ago, um, we had a phenomenal week in our Croydon store for people who had been... Uh, sorry, our Chatham store where people had been viewing um, products online and seven people wanted to buy a watch in our Chatham store that week. So uh, it was a very good week. Um, it's a separate business unit. It's a profitable business unit. So um, high expectations for future growth for our retail website as we move forward. Um, we're refreshing because of the, sex, the success of our jewelry retailing website. Uh, we're investing in our uh, currency website, our pawnbroking website, and our gold buying website so that we can focus on them individually, separated out of the general Ramsons for Cash website. So that's our online uh, activities, should see future growth. And then the last one uh, for growth on slide 15, um, the capitalization on the consolidation opportunity. So there's a picture of... Geo Payne uh, in Boscombe. It had been there for about 70 years. It's third generation. It's a good business. Um, and I've talked about it previously, and, and Martin shared the purchase price. Opportunities will come up. Um, we're well networked in the industry, so we hope that we'll be a, have the opportunity to buy other pawnbrokers as we move forward. But we're open-minded. We have converted jewelry stores um, to our model. And bought in stores of independent jewelers, uh, travel agents have closed stores, and jewelers have closed stores. So I think there's there's opportunities here for us to uh, to to move forward. Um, and we have the, the 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 cash and the balance sheet to uh, to acquire businesses if opportunities exist. On page sixteen, uh, we've got some details about our ESG policies. Um, you know, we, we're a low energy use business we have a sustainable offering if you like people take something that's second hand and use that asset to borrow against it if if the loan is is not repaid we will recycle that jewelry either as a gold item for future manufacturing or retail in the windows we recycle uh, diamonds into new jewelry we'll recycle unwanted jewelry so one customer doesn't want it another customer may and that's part of our retail offering um, within our communities and our staff, we're very conscious that we should give back to our community and we do support various issues. We've got a good Think Green campaign going through the stores at the moment, so we'll recycle and reuse wherever possible uh, and minimise our energy use. Our staff relations are um, very good. We get good engagement with our engagement surveys. Um, the scores, if you like, the feedback that we get from our staff is very positive. Uh, we have high repeat rates with our customers. We have a good, excellent, uh, not good, an excellent trust, piling, uh, trust pilot rating at 4.8 out of 5. Uh, we have very few complaints. Um, we support our customers if they're struggling financially. 
um, and believe in doing everything right. When we get into our governance, you know, not only are we AIM listed, we are FCA authorized for pawn broking and credit broking. We are HMRC approved for our money service business activities. We're a, a, a QCA member and I'm the current president of the National Pawn Broking Association. So I am um, within the business. Um, you know, we've got high regulations, good systems and controls. We have a, a strong board to support and challenge Martin and I. Uh, and we have a very experienced internal audit and compliance and risk team. So we, we think we have a responsible attitude to our ESG position uh, and we'll continue that. And, you know, the investor meet company platform allows us to have greater shareholder engagement. Uh, in summary, um strong start to the to the half of the year 2.2 million uh, profit before tax those that um follow our financials historically uh, we would make 2.2 oh, we'd make half of our profit sorry a third of our profit in the first half of the year and two-thirds of our profit in the summer month uh, so 2.2 million in the first half you would think that should be about 6.6 .6 million uh, for the year um, however, <coughs> excuse me. However, the um, the run rate should be better in the second year for the income, but we have got higher costs, as Martin explained. You know, an eight percent increase in our um, in our peer review, uh, slight increase in our energy bills, etc. But the rest of the costs well contra uh, controlled. So that's the look forward position. Proven business model. <coughs> we said that we would. Um, get through COVID, we've got through COVID, we haven't taken on any extra debt. We have a, still have a strong balance sheet. We have good assets on that balance sheet. Um, we're confident of our position um, going forward. Uh, hopefully that's displayed in the interim dividend awarded. Um, we have a strong pipeline of new stores and we have growth opportunities. So um, hopefully we can uh, continue our journey and, and, and pick up where we left off in February 20 and move it forward through 23, 24, 25. Um, there are some further slides in the back, which provides further details. I don't propose to um, covering that off. So I'm, I'm happy to go through uh, some of the questions that have been asked. Peter, Martin, <coughs> thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just using the Q&A tab situated in the top right corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Peter, Martin received a number of pre-submitted questions from investors, and I wanted to start off the Q&A session with these. The first one reads as follows. What is the cost and payback of a new store fit out? Um, well, hopefully like I say I've covered that. The capex is around, um, well, the capex and the working capital required is about a quarter of a million. And after three years, where well, we have some level of maturity, £60,000 plus is the, the store profit contribution. Perfect. Thank you very much. Moving on, what size do you see your store estate becoming over the medium term? I got asked that by the press this week and my first target number is is 200 stores and we'll probably achieve that in four years something of that order thank you very much we have another question here that asks how was the cost of how has the cost of living crisis impacted your business both in terms of operating costs and trading um so martin's you know covered off if like the operating cost that that, that cost in uh, electricity bills and uh, the the wage increases that we have put in to reward our staff um the, the, the we have a robust business model diversified business model so you look forward and think if there's turmoil in the world the gold price is usually high um, that then supports pawn broking and our purchase of precious metals so those two segments of our business should have um, if you like tailwinds with a high gold price. If you then move across to our foreign currency, I think that the, you know, the foreign currency is used, or sorry, the holiday that creates the foreign currency need is usually the last discretionary spend that customers give up. And when we come out of two years of being unable to go on holiday, I think that people this year are desperate to go. Um, you know, Martin again alluded to 80% ish of capacity of past pre pandemic capacity 
people should travel this summer. Um, I think that demand will grow into next year. Um, so I don't necessarily see the, the rising living cost impacting that. Um, and then into jewelry retailing, uh, we have a mix of products. We're a value for money proposition. Um, so people might uh, choose us over more expensive goods with other jewelers if they still want to buy jewelry. Uh, but I'm encouraged that um, in the last, you know, in, in recent weeks and months, our jewelry has remained robust. Um, and if you think of the COVID times, you know, I think the UK consumer saved up about I can't remember, 220 billion. And they've spent a bit of that in, in, in recent months. But I think that I read a report, there's about 160 billion of savings there um, saved up. So I think that um, people still have some money to spend um, and we're there to support people who maybe um, suffer some um, gaps in their cash flows or short term cash need without pawnbroking service, which, which provides a solution. So I'm, I'm, uh, I, I don't think that the headwinds are going to be a, a significant barrier to our future growth. I think the other, the other part of, of that conversation really is that as a business, you know, being so diversified, we've come through COVID a lot stronger than than some people, who particularly just being a, one of the set segments that we're in. Uh, and, it, and equally, that means that if there are headwinds, we should be able to to see them off better than than people, particularly just in, in the retail segment. So our value for money proposition will mean that we will we will trade through very strongly. I, I think. The balance of the business is, as Peter says, things will go better in retail and, and FX in certain times, and things will go better in the other segments and other times. So we've we've got a model that really is quite quite a stable model. Um, that diversification will will always see us do well in whether the, the economy is doing well or not. Perfect. That's great. The next question reads as follows. How much more investment, if any, is planned in inventory? Uh, so Peter's talked about um, you know the relocations that have worked really well in Newcastle. That the picture on the front is is day and night really from where it was before, and that's that's a much bigger window. And that's that with that comes the inventory investment. I think we've still got opportunities. That the stock we've put in, we've put some of that stock in quite late in the six months. So assuming that turns very quickly, then we would put more in. But I think you know we we've got a lot of stock now, and and if if it doesn't increase. Um, if retail, if there are headwinds, then we will probably put less into to retail. But you'd expect to see probably a million, maybe even two million, depending on the number of new stores in the second half um, and, and you know how retail trades through the summer, really. That's great. Thank you, Martin. We have a question that relates to rent reductions and asks, what level of rent reductions have you achieved in the last 12 months at lease expiry slash rent, rev, rent review date? Okay, uh, you know, we, we have seen all sorts, if I'm honest. I think that I talked about if it's a low value rent, so 10, 12,000 pounds, there's often um, competition for, the, for those units uh, from independents who might want to start a business. So, um, like I said, if, if there's only a 10% saving to be had, it's not worth taking it because of the legal costs involved, um, as long as we can get flexibility. Uh, when you have a higher uh, rental unit, thirty, forty thousand 40,000 pounds, and you can take a 10% a reduction, um, then, you know, it's worth taking and, and we, we do that and, we, you know, progress and enter into a new lease. Um, and then there's a mix. So, you know, there's some stores that we have seen 50, 60% reductions in rent. And there are some stores that I've um, uh, resisted rent increases, uh, believe it or not. So uh, there's a quite a good mix. But probably a, a ten percent reduction is the average. Perfect. Thank you very much. The next question has a few parts to it, and I know PT you might have touched on one of the parts, but I'll I'll read it anyway. Um, how many store openings a year on average are you planning over the next three to five years? What's the average capex and investment in working capital per store opening, and how long on average before a new store reaches EBIT break even? Oh yeah. So so well, new store openings eight to twelve. Over the next three to five years, average capex, um, well, I say it's roughly 50 50, so average capex 125, average working capital 125, and after three years, it's uh, 60 grand um, 
profit for the store pre head office costs. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, turning to the next question. How has the competitive landscape for the type of foreign exchange services Ramsden provide changed since March 2020? Okay, so well, there's, there's, there's the two big factors are one, there are less competitors. So travel agents have closed stores. Uh, Thomas Cook slash Hayes, Chewy of uh, uh, closing about 170 stores. That's public information. Um, and the sole bureau to change businesses are offering uh, the customer a worse price and, and a higher deal. Um, so we're able to be uh, more, we're still able to be you know, highly competitive, but wide no margins. So uh, favorable is probably, I would say, the competitive landscape since 2020. Perfect, thank you very much. Moving on, if provision of foreign exchange moves more to prepaid travel cards, how would this affect the margin Ramsden makes on foreign exchange? Yeah, it's a question we get asked quite frequently. Um, prepaid cards are not normal, uh, and not sorry, not not <laughs> new, and they're not that they're not that common. If I'm honest, um, eight nine percent of the volume of, of card spend is on a prepaid card. Most of it is done on a customer's debit card. Um, our average transaction value has increased uh, from four hundred and fifteen to four hundred and twenty five pounds when we sell currency to a customer. So there's no there's no immediate threat to that from a margin basis. Um, we would expect to be able to you know maintain margins. It's a card scheme generally has higher cost base because obviously we still need our store estate for our other services. Uh, but at this moment in time, we're not seeing a shift to card. So the, the, the travel card generally is replaced the traveler's check um, and people, you know, he used that service. Um, typically, a lot of people sell a travel card at the same rate as they sell cash, but the infrastructure cost is high. And there's obviously disruptors like Revolut. I think there's other, other questions you can see that, that mention those type of products. Obviously, they, they are for a frequent traveler, people do use these products, but certainly the, the, the too good to be true rates, I guess. Um, these businesses are losing money and eventually they've already started to, to charge more commercial rates. So we're in that space um, and we have a travel card, which we expect to, to relaunch the, this year. Um, but certainly the cash spend from people traveling is increasing, um, albeit we do appreciate that people do spend in cards, a uh, debit card as much as a travel card is probably uh, what we see. Perfect. Thank you very much. And we've got a final pre-submitted question here, which asks, how big can the online jewellery business get without cannibalising in-store jewellery sales? And how big do you think the online jewellery business will be in five years' time? Um, all for a crystal ball. Um, we, I don't see our online growth cannibalising our store estate. Our store estate covers about 25% of the UK population. Well, actually, it doesn't cover. It, it, it's close to 25% of the UK population. So we have a lot of the UK population that is not near a Ramsden. So massive opportunity for our online business to grow. Our online um, sales growth, um, our online sales are still very, very small. I read a report that the Signet Group's international sales which i believe is the uk is well over 100 million and if you look at our uh, our chart uh, it's about 2 million so there's a massive opportunity for our for growing our online jewelry business um i know that my team have got a set of uh, challenging targets for them to hit prior to five years uh but where we are in five years is a little bit into the future for me to uh, hazard a number or guess a number I guess it, the, the speed of opening stores and the speed of the growth online will, will determine the mix of how much the the, um, the retail online is a percentage. Obviously, it's 15% now. The stores are growing. The online is growing. And I guess our focus is on just growing both of those aspects rather than necessarily targeting a, a mix in particular. Thank you very much for providing some colour there. That actually concludes the pre-submitted questions. But as you can see, we've received a number of questions throughout today's presentation, and thank you to all the investors for submitting, submitting those. Could I just ask you to read out those questions and give responses where it is appropriate to do so, and then I'll pick up from you both at the end. Okay, so Paul has asked, how do you view, how do you view the 
evolution of the likes of Revolut as a risk to the FX business. Well, Martin, you know, commented on that one. Uh, Revolut have done fantastically well in growing customer numbers, but I don't believe they're making any money. Uh, and to make money, they're going to have to alter their rates. We have about 830,000 previous foreign currency customers who will hopefully use us again. Uh, and we will be able to sell a card to those or offer them a card later this year that is multi-currency, app-based, uh, and will have most of the features of a Revolut card. Uh, second question from Andy. Uh, what do you see as the biggest opportunity and how do you view acquisitions versus organic expansion? Um, well, I think we can improve what we do in the store estate uh, and I think we can grow our store estate. Um, acquisitions versus organic. I think that's the return on capital. So if if an acquisition is too expensive, I'll walk away and I'll build it through Greenfield Estate. Um, so it depends on the price. Um, obviously, the price that we paid for Boscombe was 909000 including this Jewish stock, and we thought that was worth it. Um, yeah, it just, it just, you know, it does depend uh, on that return on capital question, which we do challenge ourselves when we want to buy a business or open a new store. So, um, but I think, I think we've got growth in, in all of the, like the three self-help categories of improving what we do in store, improving what we do online, and we have opportunities to grow the, the core estate. Um, Jeff has asked, how do you expect contactless payment to affect foreign currency demand? In Europe, I'm finding contactless payment is expected in many transactions and is easier and cheaper than taking cash. Well, the, the currently travellers are taking more cash than they did previously from ourselves, whether that's a bit of inflationary, whether that's just that confidence or whether that's that uh, ability to budget. Um, lots of people like to take currency on holiday because it helps with their budgeting. Um, I think it's a challenge that we've had uh, historically. I think COVID has changed people's uh, view of using contactless payment in the UK where they're very confident that the corner shop takes it and how it works. But I look at the, you know, some of the holiday destinations, which is in Europe, and I think they, they much prefer cash. So, um, no, I think it, it is a, a challenge. It's one that we have our eye open on. It's why we're developing a multi-currency card. Uh, but I think that uh, cash, will be a a a cash will be around for a long time to come. Uh, Jeff's asked another question. For jewellery, are Ramsons doing well due to a strong market or increasing market share? I'm surprised to see this going so well considering all the other rises in living costs. Um, I said, I think it's self-help. Um, I think when, if you go back to like page seven, you know, Martin explained that it was a bit progressive. So whilst um, our revenue was, what, seven million pre-pandemic, 8 million in the, in the pandemic and then 13 million um, in the last uh, six months. The 8 million is understated really because of the, 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 the suffering of the high streets and the closures and not many people on the high streets. You know, it would have been a lot more linear, I suspect, had that been, if you like, the same trading conditions as we've had in the last six months. Um, so self-help to grow our retailing. Um, I think we therefore are increasing market share. Um, we're working very hard to uh, educate customers that we sell new and second-hand jewellery and our investment into watches, you know, 176% year-on-year growth in watches. And we're still, you know, we're only just going up to 90 stores um, where it's available for customers to see it as well as online. So I think we've got some more, more growth to come in jewellery. Peter, Martin, thank you very much for being so generous with your time there. I think you managed to get through all the questions. And of course, the company will review all questions submitted today and will publish those responses on the Investor Me company platform. But just before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to the company, Peter, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Yeah, I, th I think that, let's say that the summary for me is in February 20, we were in a good position. We had momentum. COVID has created a pause. Uh, our balance sheet as of today is slightly stronger than it was in, in February 2020. The 
the opportunities I think are uh, wider and more than we had in February 20 because of, of of what's gone in the intervening period. So we're very optimistic of future future growth of improved performance. That's the how I would uh, wish to leave the message. Thank you very much, Peter. Martin, thanks once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Ramson Holdings PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.